sometimes we want to break, but this is not the way to do it. But thanks for coming to New Holland today. Um, kind of a unique perspective. I never sit up here, so I got to watch you worship. And uh, some of you worship quite well. Some of you worship with your whole face. Now, Mark, I don't know about this dancing part with you up here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Leave that to the ones who can, brother. That's, um, that's kind of like me trying to get up here and, go, you know, trying to walk without pain is not, not easy to do. I look like I, I think I've got the Tim Conway shuffle down pat. Y'all know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Except he was trying to be a 90-year-old man, but that's just the way it is. Sometimes. Uh, Daryl said it's not good to get old. But then comes heaven. Amen. And that'll be good. That'll be good. Uh, if you have your Bible, turn to uh, Acts chapter 6. We're in our series called The Church Triumphant. We looked at a little bit of chapter 2. We looked at a little bit of 3 and a little bit of 4, a little bit of 5. So I'm not going to cover all of chapter 6. But uh, I want to talk about a healthy church. There's a, a few things that are about it. And, and the book is called The Acts of the Apostles. Basically, Luke, Luke was writing down what he saw happening in the early church. And, and, and that that's could be a great pattern for us to go by. I was taught in seminary years ago, you never get theology from the book of Acts, but you can, uh, you can get some great understandings of what we're supposed to do. And we are God's people, not the building. Y'all good with that? Not the building. It's the people. So every week we send the church out. It, every week we're missionaries in this community that God's given us. And uh, we should do it with a smile on our face, but most definitely with the Lord in our hearts. And, and looking for Him to, to love others through us and to lead us as He loves on others. So um, today, I always make you stand in honor of reading God's Word. Can we just sit? <laughs> Amen. All right, I'm actually going to get a running start with the last verse of chapter 5. Are you there? Say amen. amen. All right, God's Word says, And daily in the temple, y'all like the word daily? Daily in my Bible means the same as it does in your Bible. It means every day. Is that good? In the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Those two words we're going to talk about a little bit more in just a second. Teaching and preaching. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there was a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenistic because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Let's pray. Lord, this is a time when we meet together where we look to your word and Father, I pray that I will be able to uh, preach the word, proclaim the word, share the word of God plainly, clearly, but I do pray, O oh Lord, with the anointing of your spirit upon it. Father, we, we're simple people, and you're a great God that loves simple people. So Lord, with the still small voice of the Holy Spirit, as only you can, speak directly to hearts. And Father, in the process of that, draw us close. I, I picture in my mind, Lord, wanting to be near you, wanting to push close. Father, it would be an honor if you would just allow us to 
Crawl up so close, even if it were in your lap. Put your arms of love around us. Father, I know you have a plan. Father, you've done it now millennium after millennium, century after century, generation after generation. In all places, you're the same God, yesterday, today, and forever. And Lord, that includes us. So serve for your glory, for the honor that is your majesty. Christ to uh, let you be high and lifted up in this place. And your word says that you'll draw us to yourself. Your word says that your word will not return void. So Father, I just pray that once again you will do the Jesus work among us. Speak not only to ears, but to minds and hearts and souls. And Father, may we ever be changed by you. And Lord, today I pray that we would see ourselves as children of the King, but also as servants unto you. Lord, may we serve you well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. In chapter number 5, we see that uh, the Word of God is once again being broadcast. And there are those that do not want to hear that. And they will do anything that they can to shut it down, to stop it. Because it, it, it conflicts with them living their life their way. When you come to God, if we are going to call Him Lord, if we're going to call Him Master, then He's Lord of all. And there is only one throne, and we're not to be on it. There's only one way, and that is His way. There's one voice that we should follow. And by the way, it's not my voice. It's His voice. We are His people. We, we know the shepherd, and we know His voice, and we follow it. And when God's people together follow it, something amazing happens. The, the life of the church is growth. That shows that we're alive. It shows that we're well. It shows that God has a plan of, of working his plan through us. So we're always to be about growth. We're always to be more of him, less of us. More of the image because that's the, what the world is drawn to. That's what the world needs. All the world needs is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's good enough to hold all of eternity together. I believe it can hold my life together. So if we could just bind around that, and oh, what it was like when God changed my life. and You remember what it was like when God changed your life. And how special it was to know that God wanted me to be a part of something bigger than myself. I wasn't one of those that sought after being a pastor. But I will tell you, it is the passion of my life. People talk about the way that I preach. I don't choose that. I really have tried to calm it down from time to time. But I cannot help what God has placed within me. And it's almost like when God squeezes us, he comes out. And God puts us in a broken world. And, and we carry the truth of, of Christ, the, of the life in our hearts. And he puts us there where he can put his hand upon us. And praise God, he can use us. And you may not feel like that God, that you're worthy to be used of God, but he chose you and, and says special. Matter of fact, he formed you and made you. He gifted you, empowered you. And you should look a little bit like your dad. You, they should see the image of God in you. The sun shines in the sky, amen? But the moon is simply a reflection of who the sun is. And it shines and it is bright and it is light. But the light is not us. We're simply a reflection of God in us, Christ in us. So literally, he's left us here, as some have said, to be his hands to be his feet, to be his encourager in the world. It's his voice, but he uses us, like he used the choir. And the choir came together with all the unique gifts, one leading, some accompanying, but that was beautiful music unto the Lord. And Brother Mark, I appreciate you for sharing that song. He found out I liked that song, and 
I appreciate that so very much. Because it brags on Jesus, it just kind of blesses my heart. I'm grateful there is a, th a fountain. And I'm grateful that I have tasted and seen that it is good. So we're to be about God's work. We are to be, here's the words I like to share, on mission. And everything that we say and everything that we do and everywhere that we go, we should be on mission for Christ. So at your job, you're actually on mission. If you're a school teacher, I've got a daughter that's a school teacher. She's on mission. I remember when she came home and she said, Dad, we're not supposed to, 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 to talk to them. But, but, but she said, but Dad, if they ask me a question, I can answer them. I said, answer well, girl, answer well. They can come to her and they can say, pray for me. And you know what she's allowed to do? Pray for them. Amen? It really doesn't matter where you are. And the world will tell you you have to be quiet. The world will tell you you can't do these things. The world will say there's some things we don't talk about. Religion and politics we should never talk about. Y'all break that rule because I hear y'all talk about politics all the time. Amen? But God has put something in me, and as we talked about in Acts 4, we cannot help but share the things that we have seen and heard. So when we get to that last verse of chapter 5, it, it, here we're talking about what the apostles are doing, and it says that er, daily in the temple and in every house, and I'm excited to hear that we're going to, 2020, we're going to be doing more house to house. Very excited about that. They did not cease teaching and preaching. Teaching and preaching. Now, I like the title preacher. You can call me pastor. Don't call me reverend. Let that one go on by. Amen? I'm not a doctor, so don't call me doctor. Right? I'm just Brian. But if you want to call me pastor, it thrills my soul. You want to call me preacher? I like that. That's not an insult. You say, are you old-fashioned? I'm just Brian. I'm 57, so I'm 57 years of old-fashioned, but, but I just that's who I am. I, I think I may have shared it with some of y'all. We were walking through the Mall of Georgia, and, and, and I, all, of, all of a sudden I heard, Preacher Brian! Preacher Brian! I turned around, and it was one of my youth. And they were, they just, that's, how, that's who they know me as. They just knew me as Preacher Brian, and they didn't care, and they shouted it. By the way, that thrilled my soul. Yet, I remember going to the barbershop when I was a little kid, and they called me Little Preach. Maybe they saw something in me I didn't understand. But the word preacher literally means one who shares the good news. If I could do this right now, I'd just ordain all y'all as preachers. Just go share the good news. Tell others about the one who's done so much for you. Just do it with a smile on your face, not because you have to, but because you want to, because you're in love. Kirby, I saw that ring. Good job. Good job. You did well. I saw the smile on her face. You did a really good job. Lynn put that on that knuckle. It's never been past that knuckle all those years. By the way, they can do surgery on me and put me, they don't even ask me to take mine off. I think they look at it and say, I, it's not coming off. <laughs> Amen? That's who I am. That represents who I belong to. And the, and the word in the book of Ephesians says that we have the earnest of the Holy Spirit. It really means that the gift that was given to hold you until you are fully His. Really, the Holy Spirit is the engagement ring until we go home. We're the bride of Christ. Now, I'm very proud of my wife, and I speak of her often. I tell y'all, I love her. I love her with all my heart. But let me tell you, I love Christ more. And the more I love Christ, the more love he puts in my heart to love her and you. And I want to love you more. We should be teachers, helping others learn. We should be preachers, sharing with others. But there was a problem that came up. 
Look in chapter 6. In the first verse it says, Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint. Sindel, it don't bother me at all. Aren't you grateful we got, we got life in the church? Amen. I didn't put one to sleep in the back. It slipped out. Amen. <clears throat> how many of you know that Satan doesn't like Christ? How, do you know that, how many of you know that Satan always attacks relationships? He loves to divide and conquer. So we'll all be going around one heart and one accord, preaching and teaching the good things of Jesus Christ, and then all of a sudden somebody comes up and they have a complaint. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Well, it's just a real thing. It is impossible, it is impossible that people are not offended. Long as we're here, there will be hardships. You see, in this particular occasion, they had gotten to the place where people were, were selling property and, and they were giving all these things so that, so that people's needs could be met. I'm going to say that again. So that people's needs could be met. Well, they found out that some thought that the Hebrew-speaking widows were being, or the, the Greek-speaking Greek -speaking widows, the Hellenistics, were being neglected because the Hebrew-speaking widows were getting the, at the front of the line all the time. Now, was that a real problem? Probably was. Was it meant mean? Probably not. Y'all have heard me say this. That's just life. There are things. Now listen, I have never, ever had a problem with difficulties. I'm, my, my skin's so thick, it's like a rhinoceros. You're not going to worry me with a complaint. I actually look at it as a possibility for growth. You see, really, what can happen is this. You go through a difficulty, and you look at it, and you discuss it, and you pray about it, and you seek God's face, and God gives you an answer. And it may not be, Gary, what you want, and Kirby or Steve, it might not be what you want. Mark, you might not get your way. Virgil, you might not get your way, but we'll come together and we'll seek to do it together. We'll seek to find it. I actually like it when these things occur because if they come up, then we can deal with it well. Do y'all like that? It is only a problem if we get in the way. But if we can just humble ourselves. Do I need to say that again? That means don't get your eyes on you. That means that it's not about what you think and what you want, what you believe. But if we can come together, there, there is energy when we get together, one heart and one accord, and put, listen to me now, others over yourself well when they looked at it the apostles came forward and said you know what this is our fault by the way that blesses me too they didn't try to blame someone else they said really we've done too much now I give them grace because they were really following the pattern of Jesus think back for just a little bit when Jesus was in doing his ministry, he would walk around, people would come to him. By the way, he was a street preacher. If y'all have a problem preaching in the workplace, you are not Christ-like. He was a street preacher. He went around everywhere and people would come up and people would have issues. People would have problems. You know what he did? He would minister to people where they were with their issues, where their troubles. He would heal, he would encourage, he would teach. He would share the good news of God. He would pray with and pray for. He was there to minister to people right where they were. By the way, is that not the work of the church? Y'all shake your head like this. 
Maybe we should get some of those, what do they call the little toys that, bobbleheads. We can have a preacher Brian bobblehead. Y'all don't listen to me at all on that. We're not going to do that. Brother Craig will edit that out of the video. Amen. This is inerrant, but I'm not. Amen. We need to be like Christ. We need to be serving, and everything that he did was in the ministry of serving others. Serving others. I have a friend of mine. We have a, a mission statement here. Uh, we've had here at New Holland for a while. He went to this church when it was about 80 people. It's running over about 1,200 now. This is the mission statement for the whole church. Are y'all ready for it? Others. When they look at something, Andy, they decide as a church if they're going to do it or not based upon their mission statement. Is it about others? Think about that. Did Jesus come for his sake or did he come for the sake of others? Everything that Jesus did every day from the time that he woke up to the time that he went to bed was living out this wonderful relationship with God and God had sent him to minister to others. But yet there's a problem. There's a need. The apostles couldn't do it all. And they needed someone else to help them in this. So look what it says in verse 2. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable, it is not good, it is not expedient, it is not to your benefit that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. Today, that word business we think of someone who owns a business, and we think of the leaders there being the president and the CEO of that or the superintendent of that or the foreman of that, and, and that is not in any way, shape, or form or fashion what that word means. The word is krya in the Greek. It means of a necessity or a duty. So literally, he is saying, let's seek out from among you seven men of, the good, of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this necessity or over this duty. Who would that be? Well, this is really the beginning of the word that could be uh, described as what we call today deacons. Diaconus, and the diaconus translated uh, to the English is the word deacon. It comes together in the noun form in verse 1, in the last word, when it says, in the daily distribution, that's the noun, diaconus. Or in verse 2, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve, that's the noun form, diakeo. So literally, when you think of what we call deacons today, the title of that is not given at all in Acts 6, but a precedent is set there. There became a, an, an official office in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul is writing to the letter to the church at Philippi, and he says, to the bishops, the overseers, and to the deacons, the servants. This is where we first see them. We see the apostles there who would go on later to be called. There's three words for the, the position of overseer or shepherd, poiman, or bishop, overseer, elder, pastor. So that they're doing, and they're supposed to be giving themselves to prayer and to the word of God. This should be their calling. It's a God calling. They are, it's one of the uh, two ordained positions in our church. That means they are set aside. They have the laying on of hands, symbolizing the anointing of God on their life. 
they are to live a God-anointed life. They are to be, 1 Timothy chapter 3 gives the, the criteria, first of all, for the bishops, verses 1 through 7, and then for the deacons, verse 8 through 13. All were to be people who, ha, who were filled with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit led, listen to me now, and driven. It is the drive of my life to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. Whether it's as we gather together, whether it's in a smaller group, or wherever, wherever I, I'm given the opportunity, I should be on mission to tell the good news of Jesus Christ. Wherever, whenever, however, Jesus did that in his life. But there's, I'm one, and we are many. And the needs of us do not need to come through the one or the two or the three, but through the many. So God would call these people, listen to me now, I, I love, uh, if you want to know their qualifications, go to 1 Timothy 3. But, but look what it says. Seek out from among you seven men of good reputation. The word good is added to it. Literally, in the Greek, it says of reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and I like this, wisdom. Not just knowledge. But we need people who know what to do with it. You can quote this chapter and verse. But what are you going to do with it? Don't tell me you love. Show me your love. Don't tell me what Christians are supposed to do. Show me what Christians are supposed to do. Boy, if I could walk around, I'd walk around a little bit right now. I think y'all have gotten comfortable with me. Y'all have got to sit and target. Well, I have y'all, but I kind of broadcast when I shoot out there amongst you. God, how many of y'all have needs? Can I raise both of my hands? Actually, I can raise both of my feet. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. How many of you think the world has needs? How many of you know the world's not talking about them? They're hiding them. Or they're trying to cover them up. And they're trying to cover them up with things that really don't work. Are y'all good with that? And it leaves them lonely and empty. And they don't know where to turn. Someone asked me one time, they said, Pastor, you talk about people's smiles all the time. I do. And I love looking at your smiles. Some of y'all are going to have to work on it a little bit. <laughs> but you see, when Jesus puts a smile on your face, the world knows it. When the world watches you go through difficulties and hardships and trials and brokenness and separation through tears, but they see hope. Is there hope in Christ? <laughs> Is there fulfillment in knowing Christ? The world needs to see that. And we're supposed to minister to them. I want to preach for another hour, but I won't. In Matthew 20, two of Jesus' inner three, James and John, they got Jesus cornered and said, hey, one day, Lord, can I be at the right hand and the other on the left hand? And Jesus stopped them and said, you don't know what you're talking about. He said to them, you know the rulers of the Gentiles, how they lorded over them? And those who are great exercise authority over them. 
yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Jesus' words. Whoever desires to be great, useful, productive, let him be your servant. Whoever desires first to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus has given us the, the example, church. We're supposed to be about the business of serving in the 25th chapter of Matthew. In the parable of the talents, the Lord gave to one five, he gave to one two talents, and he gave to one one talent. If you want to argue and you think somebody else got more talent than you and you got shortchanged, talk to the boss. Because really, he looks at you all the same. Whether he gave you five or whether he gave you two or whether he gave you one, the only thing he wants is for you, for you to use what he gave you. So let me read to you what happened to the one who had the five. So he who had received five talents came and brought five others. He doubled saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents, and I've gained five more talents before, besides them. His Lord said to me, listen now, well done, good and faithful servant. <laughs> well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler of, over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. The one who had two talents came, and guess what? He used them, and they doubled them, and he said, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. Then there was one who had one talent. I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. He buried his talent. He hid his talent. This is the words, you wicked and lazy servant. He goes on to say in verse 30, and cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you think Jesus set an example before us? Jesus is our example. But in the church, we have other examples. Would the deacons of New Holland stand up? Lance, come down here. He's in the back corners of the church up there. Craig, Ricky, come down. Please, sir. Rick, Jimmy's back there. Phil, wave at us. You're in the cove. Charles, y'all may know him as Polly. Ron? Ed? Y'all come up. Jim, we're getting more. David? Y'all come on. Y'all can spread out. You look that way. Don't look at me. God called these people to be your servants. God called these people to set an example before you of service. God wants to use you, but God wants to use these men. I want you to look at their life. By the way, men, they already are. We've got others that aren't here today. I understand that. Broadus is out giving a testimony for the Gideons to do Bibles. Let me tell you about Broadus this week. They were so smart with the Gideons that they were supposed to give out Bibles on Tuesday up at North Georgia College, but they were thinking it was going to rain. So they canceled it Tuesday and sent them up there Wednesday. How many of you know it didn't rain Tuesday? How many of you know it rained Wednesday? 
And at 6.30 in the morning, Broadus was up and out, up there in the rain, up in Dahlonega, in the, in the parking lot, with a smile on his face, giving away copies of God's New Testament. Was it the here? Amen, Brother Jim. Amen. Praise God for men who are willing to get wet and cold in Jesus' name. Are y'all good with that? When you see a life in front of you, this should encourage you. And by the way, you need to encourage them. You need to work with them. You need to follow their example as they follow Christ. And the people of New Holland and the people of Gainesville will be blessed. Amen? Y'all can be seated. I had them in the altar. You think I could have given the altar call right then? <laughs> Pastor, what are you asking us to do? Church, we need to serve. We need to serve. We need to, we need to be Christ-like. The ministry of this church, we better be preaching. We better be teaching. We need to be sharing the Word of God everywhere we go. What's the saying? The world doesn't care how much you know till they know how much you care. So church, let me put a few things in front of you real quick. If you see a need, God may be speaking to you. And don't run to tell me the need. God may be speaking to you and using you to meet that need. I probably said that wrong. You can come share it with me all you want. But what I'm trying to say is, don't come and tell me so that I'll do it. Take your talent. Don't bury it. But use it for the kingdom's sake. If you see a need, meet it. Try. You may need someone to go with you. You've got some men here that are on call. I promise you, you call them, they'll answer. Number two, there's some things that we as a church are going to do. We're going to do Samaritan's Purse. Our secretary this week said, uh, are we going to do Samaritan's Purse this year? I said, absolutely. How many are we going to do? I said, well, Lynn norm normally does 250 by herself. By the way, those of y'all who know her, she's been, she's been collecting all year. The little girl up here during the ch children's sermon that says she didn't want to give anything away, that's the beginning of a hoarder. <laughs> My wife is a hoarder for Samaritan's Purse. But praise God, she gives them away once a year. But that's only one ministry that we got. We're going to do a bunch of ministries. We're going to do... We're going to do ministries for the children, for the youth. Let me talk a little bit, a bit more about that. How many of y'all been on a mission project? All right, if you have not raised your hand, we're going to give you an opportunity. I'm not going to say shame on you, because maybe you haven't been challenged and asked to be a part of one yet. But I believe everybody needs to go on a short-term mission project. And Brother Mark, I believe every one of our high school kids need to go on a mission project outside the United States. I want to see every one of our high school students get outside of the United States and see what life is like outside the United States. I think it might change them. I think that they might understand that, uh, look, I went to Korea one time, and Korea is not third world, South Korea. But the number one thing I wanted when I got back to the uh, airport in Portland, Oregon, was a Wendy's greasy hamburger. <laughs> a man can only eat so much rice. <laughs> Amen? Sometimes our, I think our youth think that uh, they want the world to do something for them. When Jesus is saying you can do things for the world, 
I think we need to challenge. By the way, some of you may need to have to pay for some of our youth to go on a mission project outside of the United States. But we're all God's people working together, serving together. There's some things that we need to do as a church. We're going to do some ministries and see if we can scratch where people are itching. I think we need a Celebrate Recovery program because we're getting eaten up with drugs and alcohol and opiates in this world. I think uh, I challenged Sheila a while back. I said, Sheila, do not let this be what Brian thinks. But I said, just pray about this. And then I said, if you will not hurt my feelings if you say no. But if you feel led to do a ministry for women who have had abortions, she came back to me and she said, I feel led. You think New Holland can do a ministry to someone who's hiding and hurting and lonely and no one else to talk to? I can't do that ministry. I believe she can. You see, it's not about one. You got that new hired gun preacher. No. I'll do what I can with the passion that God has placed in my heart. Mark and I will serve the Lord and we'll, we'll seek to serve you well. And when we fail you, I apologize. I do. And when concerns come up, we need to talk about them. Because we're greater in many. I love verse, I believe it was verse 7, where it said that the Lord continued to work through this and, and grew the church through this. I'm not saying we need 20 more deacons. We just need to turn the deacons loose to serve. In the capacity that they can, where they can, in the space of life that they're living. Are y'all good with that? I need to quit saying that. I'm saying that too much. I think we can amen that. I wonder what God could do through some simple fisherman, maybe a tax collector, you know, maybe some people we don't even know what they did, but when they were filled with the Holy Spirit and sought to live life the way they watched Jesus live life, God turned the world upside down. Some of you may need to open up your house to do a Bible study out of your house. I don't know all the things that God's going to do. But I can tell you one thing. He wants us to be a part of it. With all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. I know I took more time than I normally do, and I apologize for that too. The Methodist will beat you to the restaurant. But I want you to hear the voice of God. So let's ask him to speak. Would you bow your heads right where you are? Close your eyes. And if you feel so led, maybe you can pray this prayer with your heart to God's heart. Lord, I love you. Here am I. Send me. Here am I. Use me. Let me serve others as you, O oh God, have served me. Father, thank you for what you have done. I pray that we will be the church triumphant. Father, I pray that we would be on mission for you. Father, the opportunities are everywhere. Give us the heart to serve. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you're living your life empty. Matter of fact, you're living your life dangerously. There is one name given under heaven by which you must be saved, and that's the name of Jesus. 
And you need to come and you need to give your heart and your life to Him. He's not looking for you to reform. He's looking for you to repent. He'll change you and make you into what you need to be. I want to spend the rest of my eternity with Him. He's made a way. Through the cross of Calvary, through the blood that was shed, you can be forgiven of your sins. That is what separates you from God. He will forgive you. He will free you. He will set you free. He will love you. You are his. He is yours forevermore. The wisest thing that every person could do is give their heart and life to Christ. But Christians, are you serving or are you waiting to be served? Are you on mission or have you buried your talent? What God's given us is enough. It's just about using it for Him. This is the time of the invitation. It's the time of the decision. What are you going to do with the still small voice and how it's spoken to you today?